Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Danny. I'm an alcoholic, and I love being sober. I, uh, uh, my sponsor's sponsor passed away, a guy named Clancy, and, uh, yeah. and my sponsor is a guy named, uh, Johnny, and, uh, I met Johnny Harris in 1962, and, uh, I, I always picture, like, Mount, the Mount Rushmore of Alcoholics Anonymous, it has uh, Dr. Bob, it has uh, our co-founder, and then it has uh, Clancy and my sponsor. That's <laughs> and uh, they're all pretty cool. Uh, Clancy always told me about shaving my mustache. I came in. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous the last time. In 1968, in Solidad State Prison, and uh, I came out in 1969. I had a year clean, and the first thing Clancy said was, shave your mustache. And at that time, you couldn't have mustaches in the pen, so I was really proud to go. And every time he'd see me, he says, shave your mustache. And take off that damn hat. <laughs> and... Uh, and Johnny, I met Johnny, God, I think four times in different institutions. I was inside, he was outside. And I think the one thing that I learned from him was service. You know, uh, just being of service, just always being of service. That's what we do, you know. I think that's the only reason I'm here. Uh, when I first got here in 1969, I, I didn't play well with others. I didn't... Uh, you know, I, if you didn't know the money, I wouldn't even talk to you. I, 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 uh, I kind of, that's just the kind of way you grow up. You know, you grow up in the state and, uh, you know, you go to juvenile hall, you go to camp, you go to youth authority, you go to the penitentiary, you go to the penitentiary, you go to the penitentiary. And you're just not, you're just not real friendly. You know, <laughs> you don't, hi, I gay. You know? You don't do that, you know, and, uh, and it's funny because the first time I got introduced to AA was 1959. I didn't even know it was AA. We thought it was a party. There was a, uh, about 20 of us, the whole car load cruising around in Pacoima and on the corner of Van Nuys Boulevard and Love, Lev Street, uh, we saw a bunch of cars parked outside. So we figured it was a party. So we went to the trunk of the car. To get the tools necessary to crash parties, we got bumper jack, tire on, piece of pipe. I had three cases of beer, two cases of beer, half pint of whiskey, and uh, a, a couple of short dogs and a 38 snub nose. And uh, we kicked in the front door and walked in. And the, the, the only greeting you can get when you crash a party is either everybody rushes to the opposite side of the room, and that means they're willing to throw this event in your honor, or they rush to the side of the room that you're on, means they're not. We busted in the door, we all looked at a big sign that said, we care, and, and put the paper all the way across the room, and all these people just rushed us, but like, not visit, not to fight, they all, hi, hi, Bill, hi, hi, you know, and, uh, you know, we're not used to greetings like that. And, uh, and I always taught my troops to like stick together. We got all the weapons. We, you know, they can't beat us if we stick together. But what you guys did was, uh, did that, uh, the fighting conquer. You, uh, you had us all in like little groups of four, you know, and everybody was like, Talking about not using or not speaking. This one guy came up to me and started talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, I could care less, 
You know, I got a bowl of case of beer, three bottles of wine, half pint of whiskey. I didn't screw it shit. I'm trying to get away from this guy. And I said, you know what, old man? I hate to say an old man, but he was probably 40 years old. And uh, I'm trying to get away from him. And he goes, Danny, he whispered the curse of Alcoholics Anonymous. 1959, I'm 15 years old. This guy says, Danny, if you leave this program, you will die, go insane, to go to jail. That's the stupidest thing in the world. A 15 year old kid with. Every time I got busted, I would think about it. Die, go insane, or go to jail. I this is a poem. Every time I would. I would get Don started. Beat needs to mute his phone. There we go. Yeah. Oh, and so, uh, so anyway, uh, every time I got arrested, I would think, die, go and say, and go to jail. It's the curse of alcoholics and others. And whoever's listening to me right now, if you go out, you need to die, go and say, and go to jail. Watch and see. I guarantee it. You know what I mean? And it's funny. I've been clean and sober for about 52 years. I have yet to see somebody come back with some good news. Nobody, never. They go out, they either, uh, sadly, they either die, they go nuts, or they go to jail. You know, and I remember I was, I was arguing with this lady, I was at, I was, uh, at Cedar Sinai Hospital, and they have an alcoholic group up there, and I was speaking, I told him, this lady says, well, I've never been in an institution. And I thought, I said, this is Cedar Sinai Hospital. The, the drug, this, this is an institution. She goes, no, I have insurance. And so I think, oh, so you're relating your problem with insurance. You don't have any. And I couldn't believe it, but she honestly didn't believe that she'd ever had a problem with alcohol. I said, lady, you're in an alcohol unit. This is for alcohol. This is a meeting. And it was like, I couldn't, you know, I had... To turn on one of the women here about this lady, you know, because basically it was like denial, I mean, just complete denial. Well, my kids put me here. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, your, your kids are the ones suffering all that pain. I, uh, I had a, uh, and that's all I did. All I did was drink, use, go to the penitentiary, and and that was the way I. I I lived, and it, it was strange. It was like people always said, "Well, you come from an alcoholic family." I come from a family of drinkers. They would never call themselves alcoholics. They just drank every day. You know what I mean? I had an uncle who died of diabetes. He says diabetes, but he had a six pack of beer every day, and slowly it was like. Uncle Fred, what are you doing, man? That's nothing but sugar. No, 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 I'm okay. Beer don't bother. You don't, you don't matter. It's light beer. <laughs> so, okay. It's light beer. That's why you lost your foot, fucker. You know, and, uh, and he would just keep losing parts. And, uh, and finally he died. My, my dad, my dad was not an alcoholic. He drank every day. Drank every day. He built a bar in his house. Drank every day. Crashed his car while drunk she, and killed himself. And it's so funny. I remember my mother talking about, no, he died in an accident. I said, Mom, he died drunk. You know what I mean? And, but yet denial. I was in jail. I was in jail for this sale of loot and narcotics. And my mother was still, I said, Mom, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. No, 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 you're not. She was not. No way. You just had problems. Yeah, with drinking. You know what I mean? And so I, the minute I walked into this program, I heard, nobody gets here by the state. I walked in 1959. In 1962, in the penitentiary, I ran into Johnny Eric. He was the outside speaker. He came in and we talked. And he told me, uh, no, you didn't walk into that meeting by accident. Those were previews of coming attractions. And actually, in every penitentiary I was in, I heard, 
Alcoholics Anonymous is now meeting in the Protestant temple. All inmates wishing to, they don't meet in the Catholic Church because the Catholics have a problem with the higher power. It's either Jesus or nothing. You know what I mean? And, and so I was like, so okay, let's do the higher power. I like that. He's cool. And every institution I was in and I would hear that announcement, I would think of guy going insane and going to jail. You're all cursed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You'll thank me later on in life. When you finally get sober, you will say, I hate that Mexican, but he's the one that cursed me. And every time I got arrested, every time I got in trouble with alcohol, I heard that guy go insane or go to jail. Even the lights on the cop car, if you watch them, when they stop you, you go, die, go insane, go to jail, die, go insane, go to jail. That's the thing we hear, you see it. And from then on, it's like, I just... I had some brilliant ideas. I went to prison the last time in 1965 for selling four ounces of pure sugar to a federal agent. That was a brilliant idea. They called it sale in need of narcotics. It wasn't even dope. And like I said, <laughs> the 10 years, of, it was like, wait a minute. It wasn't dope. And it, I remember the Fed asking me, is it good? I said, it's just pure. It was a pure sugar. And, uh, God, they beat me all the way from North Hollywood to the federal building. Turn around, beat me up the way back. And uh, I'll never forget that. It's like, okay, die, go insane, go to jail. This is what happens. You know what I mean? This is what happens. You drink, you go to jail. Every time I drank, every time I drank, I wasn't like a, a, a I don't know how to say it, like a sociable drinker. You know what I mean? Uh, my family, we drank, we fought. My gang, we drank, we fought. We would fight with each other if we didn't have no one else to fight with. My first sponsor, a guy named Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. And I say that because he told me never to mention his name. But uh, in 1962, he shot a cop and shot a kid coming out of the hospital due to resentment. And he went to the pen and then but four months later, I went to the pit, and uh, and I ran into him, and he had started in the program on AA, and uh, and he said, Daddy, come on, come on to this program, and it's really good, it's awesome, man. and I said, oh, man, it's going to get coffee and cake, but I was like a professional convict, so they said, I can get coffee and cake. Well, they give you cigarettes, I said, hey, you know, I got a lock and pull cigarettes. And then he said the one commodity that was, you know, that, you know, there was girls. And I said, cool, let's go. So I made the mistake of signing up for Alcoholics Anonymous. You understand? That's, and when you sign up, you sign up for something, it goes in your jacket. And you don't say, uh, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous to see the girls. You have to say, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous to deal with my alcohol problem. And then you get to go. You got a night nice walk to get the privileges. And so I went and the girls were beautiful. And that's when I met my sponsor, Johnny Hare. And uh and God, I remember I went, I was dark, just just penitentiary down, starts, bleach, everything. Everybody else had all wrinkled clothes, all mine were all starts and all nice. And he, I remember him saying, Danny, the only thing that's gonna beat you to San Quentin are the headlights on the bus. I thought that was a compliment. I, I didn't know. I Whoa, well, okay, cool. You're just, because where I kind of came from, that's where you ended up. You know, you, you go to juvenile hall. I went to juvenile hall so many times, I thought Mexicans were supposed to go. All I seen in juvenile hall were, were Mexicans, african American, and poor white guys. Never no rich guy. Just, oh, oh, the what? And so it was, this became a a habit. It becomes a way of life. Doing whatever you have to do and then you go to jail. And uh, in uh, in 1965 when I, when I sold that sugar to the feds, uh, I had like a rude awakening because I remember I remember this guy telling me that you're going to you're going to die and go insane and go to jail. I went to the penitentiary in 1965. 66, I was in, in, in San Quentin. 67, I was in Folsom. 68, I was in Solidad. And, 
and he saw the dead, it was like kind of a, a lot of bad stuff happened. And we ended up, me, me and two other guys went to the hole and all the three of us had gas chamber offenses. And so, I, you got to remember again, there's no worse feeling in the world than a body full of drugs and alcohol and a mind full of alcohol is known. So if you're not planning to stay, don't listen to this crap. I'm telling you. Because when you're locked up and you try to get a thought, all you can think about is the problem of alcoholics and all That's all you can think about. All the people you hated, all the people you wanted to kill, and and they're like laughing at it. They're like, oh, we told you. We told you. You know, we promised you. And, and I can remember sitting in the hole and I can remember asking God, God, let me die with dignity. Let me die with dignity and I'll say your name every day and I will do what I can for my fellow man, whatever I can. I will help anybody I can. And I said, help any inmate because I knew I wasn't getting out of jail. And uh, by the by the grace of God, uh, we had, the offenses were like a DJ reject. They sent them to, to Sacramento to the district attorney. And he was no case. The witnesses were, had letters like, Popeye did it. We saw your mom throw the rock. Uh, you know, they're all just bogus. So we had no witnesses. Three, 3,000 guys on the yard. No witnesses. And, uh, and we got kicked out. We had to do our top. And I'm thinking, God, man, that's it. That's it. But then I remember, let me die with dignity and I will say your name every day and I will do whatever I can for my fellow man. So I started becoming a, a Danny do-gooder in prison. You know what I mean? It's like, I just say, I, but all you get, hey, I say hello to people. Hey, what's up? Because in prison, you don't, you're not happy. You're not saying, you know, hi, how are you? You know, you don't do that. And you, you better not look happy. You know, you, because you gotta, you got a killer face on all the time. You know, I practiced doing this. You understand? I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I was born with this mug. I practiced. And, and, uh, and then you all of a sudden then start saying hello. So hi, how are you? you know, and, and, uh, I come out of the joint August 23rd, 1969. And, uh, I got kicked out. And I remember, I remember this, uh, parole, the parole board member, one of them was Mad Dog Madden. And he said, uh, he said, bring us back a life sentence, Terry. We're trying to mess with you. And then, uh, uh Wild Bill Chavez said, uh, yeah, bring us back a life sentence. We're waiting. So no, he just kicked me out. I got out of prison. I called that Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. And he came and picked me up. He came and picked me up at the bus depot in San Fernando. And I, I went to my first meeting that night. That night, what do you mean? And uh, everything good that has happened to me on this program has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. And I really honestly found out that for Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, when they talk about being of service, it's not just being of service to the program. It's a being of service to the world. You know, it's it's not just, oh, no, I make the coffee and that's all I have to do. No, it isn't. It's about collecting clothes and giving them to the homeless. It's about feeding hospitals during this pandemic. It's about raising money for charities. About, that's what we do. That's the face of, face of our father's life. Every friend I got, and it's a God's honest truth, every friend I got, the people that I choose to bring into my home and, and love have socks and thermal underwear in the trunk of their car because we'll pass them out to the homeless. You know, all my friends, they're, they're known to go buy 20 hamburgers and just pass them out. Anything, anything, just any, any old clothes you got, you just add them to the guys underneath that bridge here or on the shirt. You know, and, uh, I remember a guy named Sam Hardy. He was a sponsor of mine for a while before he passed away. But, uh, but he went a big old hillbilly from Alabama somewhere, right? And I'll never forget, he had done 15 years flat in, in, uh, in, uh, Backerville. Backerville is a state mental hospital for the Crimean Saints. And I'll never forget, I said, Sam, what'd you do? And he goes, you already had that. 
the shit in my head. Well, then, instead of an argument, I got killed one gentleman and murdered another one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and he always had these words of wisdom. He always said stuff like, well, you understand, you've got to do things for other people and not expect any kind of reward. And I could have, I could have forgot it if he said it in English, like reward. But he didn't. He said, oh, kill me. Three walls were dead. And it would always be in my head, three walls were dead. And so I started, when I came out of the bed, I started taking out the old people's trash in my mom's neighborhood. Just, just, because this then needs to put everything in a bucket and pull it out. And that's what I started doing. Just, I didn't know, I didn't, I did not know how to be a nice guy. You, you, you better not be a nice guy walking around Folsom Prison or San Quentin Prison or, or Soledad. You know, or Tracy, you better not. You better be willing to do whatever it takes to 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 stay a man. That's that's it. And, and I'll tell you, anybody that goes to penitentiary that doesn't understand that you're going to be a predator or prey, I don't believe it. And uh, when when I come out, that's all I did. I started digging up trash. I, everything good that happened. Happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Me and a kid named Danny Levitt started a gardening business. And I would say, Danny, he was a pretty little white kid. He, he'd go up to the door and knock on the door and he'd go, Hi, ma'am, would you like me to mow your lawn? They go, Certainly. And then I'd show up and, and uh, because I wouldn't have got the job, you know what I mean? But Danny would get it and then we'd ask him, Do you have a lawnmower? And they go, Yes. And then, Do you have trash? Yeah, had nothing. And all I had was a 59 in Paula Chevy, and that was good because I had a real big trunk, so we could put all the, all the trash in the trunk and then go dump it in bonds. And, uh, and that's what we did. We had a gardening business. We had our actual gardening business. We were making a living. And when I went to the pen, there was a lady that lived in my mom's neighborhood who had a beautiful yard, really, really beautiful yard. And, uh, and uh, she had two sons and her husband, and they always, every Saturday, they're working on their yard. And so anyway, I go to the joint, and I come back out uh, four and a half years later, I see her, her yard is a jungle. You know, I even asked my mom, what happened? She said, well, one of her sons was killed in Vietnam, the other one was killed in a gang shootout, and her husband committed suicide. And uh, and so she turned into the witch lady, the, the lady that, Turns all the kids into cats if they're bad, you know. And, uh, and I know every neighborhood has one, and so anyway, so, so every day, every other day, like every twice a week, me and Danny would go and do something on her yard, just do something, anything, just make it a little possible. And and every time we go, she would pass out. She would put this this uh, pitcher of of lemonade out onto the porch and two glasses. And one of my fantasies when I was in the pen, it was to like be in Las Vegas and have some fine cocktail waitress bring me a, a tall glass, a, a, a drink in a, in a crystal glass because because the crystal makes such a different sound than like a tin cup or a tumbler. You know, the crystal has that clink clink clink. And every time she would put it out there, I hear that clink clink. And not exactly what I meant, God, you know, but, but I, but I remember that fantasy. And, and I would get the drink, I'd hand one to Danny, I'd say, drink that. And he'd take a drink. And, uh, do you feel like going like, it? <laughs> okay, well, this is not cat poison. So we go ahead and have this memory. And, uh, and one day we had a shark, we had a yard looking pretty nice. And this guy comes over, big old dude comes over and says, Hey, Poncho. That's ten dollars right there, buddy. What? And he says, uh, "How much you charging the lady?" I said, "Nothing. She's a crazy lady." And, uh, and uh, he said, "Well, come on over. I want you to look at my yard. Uh, and bring Pablo with Pablo, Danny Levitoff. That's another ten dollars." And so we we go over to this guy's yard, and he starts telling us what he wants. And and this is you know this is like nineteen seventy, so this is like we got him all the way up to fifty bucks. Uh, you know, uh, a week and uh, and uh, I mean a month, fifty bucks a month, and uh, and I remember they would go to his garage and he and he lifts up the garage. He's got every garden tool known to mankind. He had the kind of garage for the 
garage is painted blue and there's a white hammer. You know his hammer's missing because it's painted white. It's, it, oh, your hammer's gone because everything is has a paint. And I said, God, this is like a shrine. And uh, and he says, look, I'll give you this garden equipment if you do my lawn for free. I, I love doing gardening, but I have a heart attack and my wife won't let me do it. I said, Mr. I'll come over and wash your back. I mean, we had so much equipment. To this day, we didn't have a we didn't have a lawnmower. We used to borrow it. We would borrow a lawnmower from somebody and then go around the neighborhood with their lawnmower and then come back and mow their lawn at the end of the day. And uh, and uh, uh, we started and we and we actually started a big business. And then my dad was working in Marina Del Rey uh, as a contractor with a bunch of buildings, so he would get us jobs and we'd go and put a bid in. When we started making, when we finally grew, we had like four trucks, about five guys, six guys working for us. And that's when I told I threw my business and said, we got out of it. But, and uh, I went into being dr- uh, drug abuse. And everything good that has happened to me happened as a direct result of helping someone else. I got into the movie business, helping someone else. Helping someone else. Got into, hey, you want to be in this movie? Sure. And then I ran, I got on as an extra, and then I ran into this, uh, this friend of mine named Eddie Bunker, who I was in prison with. And Eddie said, Daniel, are you still boxing? I said, nah. But I saw you win the lightweight and the welterweight title up in San Quentin. I go, yeah, I was fighting quite a bit. He said, we need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. And I said, what's it pay? Because they were going to give me 50 bucks back to like a convict. And, uh, me and Eddie laughed because we've been acting for like comics all our lives for free. And uh, I mean, he said, uh, it pays three twenty a day. And when he said that, I said, how bad you want this guy to be up? I thought, I thought he wanted me to beat somebody up. I had done it for another 50 bucks. But I figured I'll do it and then I'll write about it and then tell my sponsor. Hey, I, I'm all going to make amends. But he said, no, no, you can't hurt this kid. Man. He's a the movie star and uh, he might sock you. I said, for 320 bucks, give him a stick. I've been beat up for free, man. I started working with an actor named Eric Roberts, had a box for a movie called Runaway Train. The director saw me, saw that I could handle Eric, and picked me to be in this movie. And from that day to right now, I've got over 350 appearances on different films. And if you ask me, how I did it, I didn't. I showed up. That's all I've ever done. Showed up. My agent had this silly ass movie that I didn't want to do. You know, and I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a pretty well known actor then. And I had, they wanted me to do this movie. And I'm saying, there's no money. They don't have no money. And she, I know, but this is going to turn into a good movie. And she, my agent, she thinks she's so smart. No, this is going to. They want to give me 50 damn grand over here. And Dan, please, listen to me. Okay, so we do this movie called Badass. And uh, it turns into a trilogy. So I did Badass, Badasses, and Badass on the Bike. So I made like three times the amount of money that I was going to make on that other movie. Plus, on the first movie... I ran into this producer named Ash Shaw. And he saw that I like good food. I won't eat processed food. I don't eat fast food. I will eat good food. I did. 76 years old is like, you better watch your diet. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, Daddy, why don't you open a restaurant? And jokingly, because my mom and I always talked about opening a restaurant. My mom was a great cook. But my dad was like a Mexican Archie Bunker. You know, my dad, when we talked about restaurants, my dad would, hey, I got a brand new stove in there. Why don't you get your ass in there and cook whatever the hell you want? I mean, it was like just that my mom was kind of like, like chained to the past. She was, she was really a housewife. And in fact, in the fifties, women didn't really work, you know, and, and, uh, and it was kind of, if your wife worked, I, I remember, Everybody was around like a picnic or something, and somebody would go, Hey, Art, Art, you want a beer? Oh, no, hey, wait, Bonnie, hey, can I have a beer? Because 
because body work. And so it was like humiliating, but that was my family. You know, and uh, and so just jokingly, I said what me and my mom always talked about, Trejo's Tacos. And two movies later, that we did Badass, yeah, the third movie, Badass on the Bayou, Ash brought me a business plan. And me being the brilliant businessman that I am, I immediately gave it to that smart aleck agent. Uh, and she read it and said, Danny, it's a new brain. You know, it's like somebody's not asking for $50,000 up front. You know, just, you're going to do all right with it. So, anything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. direct result of helping someone else. I got seven restaurants right now and a donut shop. It is why a donut shop. I like the police. They like donuts. And uh, and I even got I even got a restaurant with that pup guy. You know the pup, the pup. He's got one at LAX. I got one at LAX. And I I've, I've heard him all yeah, yeah, the pup. And, and so we're well, the trailer. We got a, a restaurant there in Terminal One, and uh, they want to put one in in. Denver, Colorado, and one in New York, and one in San Antonio, and one in Hawaii as soon as this, this pandemic quits. You know? And so I am one of the people that like, you know, I, I do rescue, and I got five dogs right here. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, no, six. I don't know, I'm sure. I, you know, I, I rescue animals, and, and I help kids. Mario, uh, one of my assistants, we worked with white folks that just come out of prison. All of them, got a whole house full of them. You know, and they, uh, they're all doing good. They're all doing good. Not because of, but because of the program of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because of the program of Narcotics Anonymous. Because of Cocaine Anonymous. I spoke at an A meeting. I know, at an OA convention one time. Because I said, why am I speaking here? I've never had a, you know, you talk about the disease of addiction, Danny, and where it's taking you. And let me tell you something. I don't care what you're addicted to. They could put us on the moon. If they could put us on the moon, and in a in a month, we would be sniffing moon dust. And this shit is good. And we would be making booze. It's that simple. I drank booze in every penitentiary I was in. We made it. And I'm going to tell you right now, because you're not supposed to say whether you're someone's an alcoholic if you've been in the penitentiary and you drank Pruno, you're a damn alcoholic. Because nobody would drink that shit but an alcoholic. You know what I mean? I, I can remember having a, a Folgers coffee jar full of, of booze, and it was still bubbling because the yeast hadn't finished, drinking it and trying to hold it down no matter what. Because you knew if you kept it down, you were going to get a buzz. And it was like, wow, this has got to be, this is, this has got to be a disease. You understand? And I, I, I thank God for this program. Right now, my daughter has gone on seven years. My son is going on six years. And so I, I thank God I took them to meetings when they were babies because my son said, dad, the first time I smoked weed, God, man, I was like nine. And I, I felt like I slipped. Because he'd heard all about Smith. I felt like I slipped. And so he was fighting this disease. So anybody that knows about this program has to fight this disease. You have to fight it. Because I woke, I've been so loaded on heroin and hallucinate that I'm in a meeting. That's the awful, awfulest thing in the world. I've been in nightclubs and I can look at a guy that was that was in, in meetings. I can, and, and you can hear a guy in a bar, hey, I had 30 days. And, and he's got his chip. And it is like the most miserable existence in the world, having a body full of drugs and alcohol and a mind full of alcohol and stuff. That is miserable. Prayer, simplest program in the world for complicated pieces. People. people, you wake up in the morning, say your prayer. I, some of my prayers are small. God in all his wisdom didn't make me too wise. So if I do something stupid today, it won't take him by surprise. That one's good for me. 
giving me, because I know I'm going to screw up some kind of way. And then I get on, what am I supposed to do? I look myself in the mirror, brain broke, because I'm bodily and mentally different than my fellow men. My brain's broken, and so I know when I look at booze, I see a skull and crossbow. When I see somebody loaded, it, I don't, I don't get a feel like, oh God, I wish I had some dope. I think of what happened. No, let me see. You shoot dope, you end up showering with 50 men in San Quentin, trying not to look. You end up, you end up in, in a, in a drunk tank, throwing up all over the place with your, somebody else. You know. So he said, like, well, that's what happens. I go and say, go to jail. That's what I know for a fact. I could be a fortune teller. Do you understand? For people that want to go out and drink, if you came to me, I could wear a salami hat and a big robe. You would come to me and say, oh, Mr. Salami, I, I, I want to go out with you and drink. Can you tell me what's going to happen? Oh, you're going to lose your family. You're going to wreck your car. You're going to get a 502. Oh, my God. Your wife or husband's going to throw you out. And just go right down the line. And when all that shit happens, you would say, my God, I should have listened to that Mr. Salami. Because it would be right on. And it's not because I'm so damn smart. Because I've seen that over 52 years. Everybody. Everybody that's gone out. That's made it back. I've got some friends didn't make it back. I got one kid doing life on top of life. And, uh. And he had, I think he put together about two years and then decided that he wasn't uh, an alcoholic. And, you know, short dog has nothing to do with social drinking. That's for the wine oaks, nothing. A short dog has nothing to do with social drinking. And uh, I love being sober. I love waking up being, and everything. Well, what is success to you? Because I got this, I got that. None of that. What's success to me? I'm going to lay down tonight. And I'm going to feel good about myself. You understand? Oh, God, thank you. And I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning, and I, I got real plans. They don't work out. It's okay. But but I'm going to wake up feeling good about myself. You understand? That's success. And all I got to do is the same thing. Say my prayers. Get in touch with another addict, alcoholic. Look in the mirror and say, brain broke. And get on about my day. Because you have to understand, when they talk about the miracle, the miracle, if you're an alcoholic and you wake up sober, you're already in the miracle. You're already in the miracle. Now, how can I How can I keep this miracle going or how can I screw it up? The choice is yours. And I'll promise you one thing about this program. If you leave, you're going to die, go insane, and go to jail. That's what happens. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Good story, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.